Thank you everybody for joining. My name is Maya Levine. I'm a product manager at Sysdig. And today in this presentation, we're going to dive deep into the world of identity security. And I'm going to start with a question for all of you, which is, when it comes to identity security, are you confused? And if you are, I want to tell you that that's very understandable, because things in cloud are complicated, they're evolving really quickly, and identity in the cloud in general is a relatively new frontier. And it's essential and non-negotiable that we be investing in it and trying to get it right. Because we can think of identity as almost the new perimeter. Almost every single cloud breach in the past few years has taken advantage of mismanaged permissions, identities, and secrets. And as an industry, we're actually really struggling with identity security, especially when it comes to the scope of how many permissions we grant that are not being used. Only 2% on average of all the permissions that we're granting are actually needed and actually being utilized. And some of the challenges here that we're dealing with uh, include the fact that ownership of identity posture is not very clear between these different groups. And that can lead to mistakes that stem from going too fast. In addition, human and machine identity management is really complicated. And if I am a robber and I'm scoping out your house, probably the first place that I'm gonna look is under the mat or under the pot that's by the door, places where I know that people tend to leave keys. Similarly, when it comes to secrets harvesting, attackers know where to look. And that includes serverless function code and IAC uh, template files. These files often contain credentials, secrets, or other sensitive information, and they're often overlooked because they're kind of obscure. In addition, SaaS applications are a huge attack surface. Credentials are being left everywhere, from repos to GitHub to AD to Slack. The list goes on and on. And to make matters worse, defenders usually underestimate the power of read-only access. They think, oh, it's just read-only, what damage can be done? But that's sometimes all an attacker needs in order to read sensitive data. So basically, attackers are better than we are at secrets management. And this makes sense because for them, getting their hands on a really bad credential is their golden ticket to being able to do whatever they want in an attack. But for defenders, this is usually not the highest priority item. And humans make mistakes. I don't know if any of you ever watched The Weakest Link with this very scary British lady. She would eliminate a contestant and tell them that you are the weakest link. And I think that humans are the weakest link in most security uh, organizations or posture in general. But again, I don't think that this is really their fault. I think it's understandable because of the complexity of systems. We are asking people to understand a much more broad scope of very highly technical items. And they might not have the correct tooling or systems to manage it all. But we are finding that social engineering accounts for 98% of all cyber attacks. Verizon found that 82% of breaches have some human error involved. And when it comes to MFA abuse, social engineering actually still works really well. Maybe the biggest challenge of all is the speed of cloud attacks. So Sysdig's threat research team has found that on average, cloud attacks take 10 minutes to execute start to finish. Now, if that's the case, that means that we need to defend at a faster speed than that. Right? And I don't have to get into, in this presentation, the complexity required to detect and respond to attacks with such speed. But because we're focusing on identity, I'll just mention here that when it comes to correlation, identities can really help because we, they can track somebody doing something malicious across accounts or detection boundaries and paint a picture of an attack. Now, what I want us to do in this presentation together is go through real life examples. So I'm gonna walk you through real breaches that either affected organizations or were discovered by threat research teams on HoneyNet. So these are all talking about tactics that we have observed attackers actually using in the wild. 
And the first one is a really great example to show that humans do make very understandable mistakes in the cloud that can be the reason why a breach was successful. So here, the attackers targeted a Jupyter Lab notebook container that was deployed in a Kubernetes cluster, and they exploited vulnerabilities there to gain initial access. Once in, they used scripts uh, to look for AWS credentials in a bunch of locations, including instance metadata, file systems, and Docker containers. They're installing AWS CLI and PACU on those exploited containers to try to continue to exploit these environments. And they actually managed to do so um, and successfully stole AWS credentials. With that, they were able to start reconnaissance. So they're looking for different resources. What, what can I access with the credentials I have? And what other credentials can I get access to? And here, they actually were able to create a new user and access key because of the smallest mistake that a CSPM tool would not pick up. So what may or may not be case sensitive is different according to every cloud provider and it can be really hard to remember. If we look at just policy resources in AWS, the action is case insensitive, but the resource part is case sensitive. So here they had a deny policy to try to keep anyone from creating access keys, but they wrote it with a lowercase a and they had a user that had an uppercase a. That's the user that the attacker used to create access keys and gain further permissions. With that permission, they ran EC2 instances with miners and they actually successfully exfiltrated data. So here's an example where the victim was actually trying to do the right thing, right? They were doing a least permissive policy to try to block this critical action, but it was a tiny typo that messed it up for them. So when it comes to least permissive, it's not just a buzzword. Again, they were trying to do the right thing, and if it wasn't for that typo, the attacker wouldn't have been successful. But you want to be reducing the scope of the permissions that all of your users and machine identities can access and do. It's also really important to identify a clear owner for IAM in your organizations. So it could be IT, it could be ops. It doesn't actually matter who it is. What's more important is that someone owns it and is responsible for catching these types of mistakes, right? These little mistakes that are different for every cloud provider. So somebody needs to invest in learning all these intricacies and own the fact that they are gonna be looking for these types of things. Now in the second attack, it's really a compilation of different patterns that were observed by the Sysdig threat research team. Most attacks start with getting their hands on credentials and they'll try to find these from open buckets, from GitHub, from public registries. From there, they'll go into the cloud account and really try to see what else they can access. They're gonna enumerate resources with their current credentials, what can I access? What other things can I access even further? And at this point, it's really important to note that you shouldn't be overlooking things like Terraform state files and serverless function code because attackers are targeting these for stored credentials. And where possible, they're going to abuse your policy misconfigurations for their end goal, which is usually profit driven. So we'll see them deploying crypto miners or uh, doing ransomware attacks, but sometimes it's not profit driven. What they do is they target existing resources, like your EC2 instances, and can use them as a jump box to launch, to launch onto their next targets. Now, when we think of lateral movement in the cloud, we're usually thinking of going from one account to another account. But we witnessed an attacker move laterally from an enterprise cloud account to the compute infrastructure, in this case, EC2. And this type of attack lets them pivot onto on-premise servers if the servers in the cloud are connected to the on-premise servers, which often is the case. So the attacker leveraged an API called send SSH public key to access the EC2 instance so that anybody that had that SSH public key could connect to the EC2 instance via SSH. And the problem with this type of lateral movement is that it, it causes issues for defenders because it involves crossing a detection boundary. What the attacker did is it moved from the cloud control plane API, which is CloudTrail, 
into the compute instance itself where CloudTrail is not gonna track anymore. So as a defender, you need both to be looking at CloudTrail logs and to be looking at your EC2 workloads at runtime. What's the behavior and what are they doing there in order to understand the full scope of an attack like this. So don't assume that your on-premise and your cloud environments are isolated. Uh, in the cloud, you have all of these different entry points and you can't assume that they're isolated uh, just because some of these are in the cloud and some are not. You need visibility in all of these and really to try to understand where these connections are. Employing some kind of secrets management system is really gonna reduce your likelihood of credential leaks. So it keeps your keys and your credentials in a centralized location and provides an API to dynamically retrieve them. This will reduce the chance that your keys and credentials are inadvertently left in files. As I'm sure you've all heard, CSPM solutions help you harden and prevent. This is where you'll avoid misconfigurations that uh, attackers can take advantage of. But you also need the runtime security. So like I mentioned, you want runtime security at both the cloud logs and on activity that's occurring in your compute resources to understand attacks that cross detection boundaries. This next attack is highlighting the danger of having overly permissive, specifically for IAC services. So the threat actor used a very well-known uh, VPN service called CyberGhost to hide their source IP, and they used the Assume Role API to get additional privileges and continue into the environment. With these new extra powers, they did enumeration, looking for new and interesting information. And they found that the group that they had joined had special privileges in CloudFormation. So the attacker called an API, create stack, and tried to add a CloudFormation template called, and I kid you not, evil template. So they weren't the sneakiest of attackers. They really weren't hiding what they were trying to do here. But this is actually a success story for least permissive because they didn't have the permissions to actually execute that action. So that's what saved the victim here from kind of malicious things further escalating. So in terms of visibility, I like to say that you can't secure what you don't know about. And this is especially true in the cloud given just the dynamic nature of resources. Uh, an inventory of all your cloud assets, including the more dynamic ones like Lambda functions um, and the policies with their security status can help you to ensure that no unprotected assets get deployed. When it comes to IAC security, you wanna do everything you can to detect drift. So ideally your company has a baseline that they've established that this is the correct thing of how it should look like. And if things drift from that, you get alerted. And ideally those security checks happen as further left into the pipeline as you can get them to be notified of them sooner. And once again, I will stress that real-time threat detection is important and the real-time part is key. I'll bring it back to the fact that cloud attacks take on average 10 minutes to execute. If you're getting notified of, an, of something an hour after it happened, you are way too late. So you want the real-time piece for your runtime uh, threat detection. This next attack, I think, is an example of social engineering at its finest. So we have an attack that began with a group called Scattered Spider. They were targeting MGM Resorts International, uh, which is a global hospitality entertainment company. And what they did is they looked on LinkedIn for users that they thought would have high access in Okta. And they exploited password reuse to get, those kind of, to get those credentials. So once they got credentials of those users, they are able to gain access to MGM's environment and establish a foothold by tricking the help desk with uh, vishing uh, attacks, which is like voice phishing attacks. And the help desk reset their MFA and get, basically granted them deeper access into the MGM environment the kind of access that is actually the stuff of nightmares. If you look at the three uh, admins that we have up here, basically this is everything under the sun you can do. 
And they took advantage of that. What they did is they configured an additional IDP within MGM's Okta tenant using inbound federation. And that allowed them to maintain persistence within the network. And with that type of access, they pretty easily were able to pivot into the VMware infrastructure. And this is where they deployed ransomware on many, many servers. They actually called in a different attacker group called Black Hat to deploy ransomware to encrypt several hundred ESXi servers that hosted thousands of VMs that were supporting critical systems in MGM. And the result here was just cascading chaos. So it really impacted MGM's operations and services like hotel room keys, dinner reservation systems, sales systems, and slot machines, which how much money are related to those in Vegas, all went down. And we don't know what the full extent of the damage is here, but it's estimated to have been over $8 million a day. So clearly a very widespread uh, result here of this attack. So there's a lot of takeaways here. The first is that do not synchronize your credentials between on-premise and cloud resources. This opens up many attack vectors. The worst part about this breach was that MGM's IDP was configured in a way that allowed the threat actors to pivot into the VMware infrastructure where they could deploy the ransomware. The second takeaway is that your IDP admin accounts should be managed with the highest level of scrutiny that you can. So a lot of things here, right? Obviously rotate your admin passwords, check a user's device and enrollment and compliance, um, have some kind of help desk verification controls for these admin users. But these are the kinds of ad administrators and credentials that when attackers get their hands on, the result is over $8 million of losses a day. Another takeaway for me here is that ransomware as a service is actually a big business. So as if we didn't have enough to worry about, threat actors that don't have the know-how or the technical chops to deploy ransomware themselves can easily get that as a service from the dark web from different threat actor groups that offer it for sale. So it is a part of the criminal supply uh, chain. And for MFI, MFA device reset, this was a significant choke point in the attack. So if you can limit your MFA device to a specific phone number that's associated with the user, that'll help. And you can alert on MFA device changes. So if an attacker is trying to change that, that should be a big red flag that something is wrong. You can also require multiple authorizations for critical actions. This next attack focuses on how attackers can blend in really well while establishing persistence. So here an attacker gained access through a misconfigured Kubernetes API server that allowed unauthenticated requests from anonymous users with privilege. They sent an HTTP request to list secrets and API requests to gather information. And then they achieved persistence through RBAC. So what they did is they created a new cluster role that had admin privileges. And because it was a cluster role, it wasn't bound to a specific namespace. Then they created a service account that they called Cube Controller in the Cube system namespace. And finally, they created a cluster role binding that bound the cluster role to the service account. And that's how they achieved persistence without setting off any alarms because the way that they named everything made it so that it blended in really well with the API audit logs and looked like a legitimate cluster binding. Now what the persistence meant here is that even if the anonymous user access that allowed the initial entry point got disabled, the attacker still could access this cluster. They found AWS access keys exposed in the cluster and then moved even deeper into the victim's AWS account. They deployed containers using daemon sets to run the Monero crypto miners. And here they actually used a container image that had Kubernetes IO in the name. It was a container image that we found on Docker Hub. And it impersonated a legitimate Kubernetes IO account. When we inspected this image on Docker Hub, we found that it was pulled many, many times, meaning this was a very widespread campaign. And this image was made to look like a legitimate one that was designed to run continuously. So it didn't raise any eyebrows when it was 
running continuously. And no one thought that it was a crypto miner. They thought it was a legitimate deployment. So very sneaky. Um, I've mentioned it already. I will say it again. Overly permissive is one of the most important things if you're thinking of tackling identity security. This whole thing started with a misconfigured API server that was overly permissive. And when you grant a ton of permissions, what you're doing is you're basically giving a gift to attackers. Because the truth of the matter is, we can't always control if an attacker is going to get into our environment. Even if we are perfect, there are still zero day attacks and zero day vulnerabilities that attackers can take advantage of. Once they're in, if you've allowed them to do every action under the sun, then they're gonna be able to do a lot more damage. Now, if this victim had Kubernetes audit in place, they could have detected the new cluster role creation and the cluster role binding. So you can do it so that you alert on these and add your exceptions like for GKE automation. And finally, consider having runtime analysis that has a level of machine learning. The standard way of detecting crypto miners often looks at known mining pool IPs or for a file name that's a known crypto miner. But again, there's zero day threats, ones that we don't know about yet. And this is where this can help because it looks for CPU and memory and network activity. For the next attack, Here's an example of how hard-coded credentials can be a gold mine for attackers. So this was an attack on Uber. The attacker gained access to Uber's IT environment by getting credentials to their VPN infrastructure from the dark web. So that's another source, right? When there's credential leaks, often those same credentials will be sold on the dark web and then used in other attacks. So here, they took those compromised VPN credentials and they repeatedly tried to log in. Every time they tried, it generated an MFA notification. And then they pretended to be Uber IT support and reached out to the contractor whose credentials it was, encouraging him to accept the MFA notification. Finally, they did, and that's when they had access to Uber's VPN. There, they found a network share that contained a PowerShell script with hard-coded privilege credentials to Uber's Privilege Access Management, or PAM, solution. And that is as bad as it sounds. Because again, this is the type of access that you really, really, really don't want attackers to have. These credentials appear to not have been rotated in quite a while, which makes them a lot easier to exploit. So harvesting these hard-coded credentials, they accessed the PAM system and they took secrets and compromised critical company systems and were pretty easily able to exfiltrate secrets from internal Slack messages and files from Uber's finance team and exfiltrate all that data out. So a big takeaway for me here is that while MFA is required and important, it might not be enough. Don't think that if you have MFA, check identity security complete. Also, hard-coded embedded credentials are a huge, huge risk. It was those hard-coded credentials to the PAM system that allowed the attacker to basically gain whatever they access to whatever they wanted. So consider getting experts at secrets harvesting working for you. There are people, third-party uh, you know, companies and people who that's their job. They look for exposed credentials, and wouldn't you rather pay them to find it than find out through a breach? So it's always an option if you don't have the capabilities to find these yourself. And don't underestimate the power of employee education. Because if people can be tricked into clicking a link, phishing email, they can most certainly be tricked into accepting a push notification from their employer's own MFA. And the basic identity hygiene is to rotate your apps. Your apps. I think my mic died, but can you all still hear me? So, the next attack, we're going to talk about what makes what storage resources more vulnerable to ransomware attacks and data and data creation. In this initial compromise, it started with a long-term credential. Do you see a pattern? How many of these attacks start with long-term credentials? Um, 
From there, they were looking for what for users, buckets, keys I can access. And I actually saw them targeting AWS simple email service. This is an interesting attack vector that we are seeing become the increasing target for threat actors for phishing. They tried to create additional users with names like Bruce, like an admin and all of that, but they didn't have the privileges to do that. So what they did instead was they found S3 buckets and they checked if bucket versioning was enabled. What this was is if it is enabled, it basically allows the bank to restore the data pretty easily. And they did, they did enable it, but they didn't have the permissions to not disable it. So the attacker disabled the versioning and then did the whole ransomware shtick, right? They exfiltrated the data out of the bucket, they deleted the data, and then they left a ransomware note on the S3 bucket itself. For this investigation, we actually confirmed that they exfiltrated data out through the AWS bill because this environment didn't have cloud trail anymore. So, so AWS billing records, every time you move data out, it actually incurs a cost. And that's how this whole attack was exposed. So it is worth thinking about utilizing CloudTrail for detections for data events. But I will say, only do this on your most important data storage. Because there's a level of priority that needs to happen here because this can generate a lot of events, which can be really costly. So if you have a storage that has really, really sensitive data, it might be worth to weigh that cost of enabling CloudTrail with the cost of you know, having that data that's filtrated. And consider IAM roles instead of having long-term access keys wherever possible. This minimizes the risk of credential abuse and it limits long-term credentials, which I'm hoping by now you realize are risky. So audit your access keys, ensure that they are not publicly accessible, and regularly rotate your access keys. Also, certain actions like disabling bucket versioning and deleting data those actions should have additional safeguards. You should enable MFA for those specific things because, again, there could be consequences to those actions. Now, I saved this attack for last because I think it is one of the more creative uh, techniques I've seen attackers employ in the past few years. So this was an attack originally reported by Microsoft. They called it Strawberry Tempest. And here, the threat actors used a bunch of different methods to try to compromise user identities, including phone-based social engineering and SIM swapping and insider threats. They actually posted in a public Telegram channel an ad asking for credentials, access to VPN systems, just in public, in a Telegram channel, which I thought was pretty cheeky. They're looking on the dark web, they're looking at password stealers and exposed credentials in public videos. And more than just trying to find credentials to uh, use here, once they got credentials, they did a lot of research about the users whose credentials it was in order to be able to answer security questions that pop up later. So once they got their initial access, they do the typical reconnaissance, right? What other credentials and intrusion points can I access? And they're using tools like AD Explorer for that enumeration. And then they're escalating their privileges by exploiting vulnerabilities everywhere they can, in things like Jira and GitLab and Confluence. And here, they actually convinced help desk personnel to recite credentials by having English speakers call in and answering questions like, what's the first street you lived on? What is your mother's maiden name? So this is proof that they were really doing their research in that initial phase. To actually exfiltrate the data out, they used dedicated infrastructure. So they chose VPN egress points that were the same as their targets so that they wouldn't be caught on things like impossible travel. They exploited cloud tenant privileges in order to create admin accounts, manipulate email transport rules, delete other admins. And here's the craziest part. They deleted resources on purpose 
to trigger incident response and crisis response process, and then they joined those crisis communication calls and listened in to the incident response workflow in order to understand how they can best initiate their extortion demands. So, a lot of creative tactics here, I have to say. This, this uh, attack group here did a lot of things that I thought were out of the box. Um, so the takeaways for here is requiring trusted endpoints is always going to just reduce your risk uh, for data theft. So if you can have antivirus solutions that are blocking malware variants, if you can just enhance your attack surface reduction rules, that always helps. The more modern authentications for VPNs are also helpful. So OAuth or SAML that are connected to Azure AD to, for VPN authentication, having risk-based sign-in detection, and just in general things that you can do to kind of reduce the, or, or have more accurate risk detections here. And finally, your incident response uh, organizations in your company need to establish operational security processes Check on your Zoom calls that everyone that's on there is supposed to be on there, right? Um, unauthorized attendees are now proven to be a technique that attackers are using. Establish out-of-band communication plans for incident responders and keep your incident response plans closely held, not easily accessible, not just publicly somewhere in uh, your company's environment that anyone who reaches you can then access them. So, we flew through a lot of stuff in just 30 minutes, so I'm going to try to summarize some of the key points here. In terms of tools for how to improve your cloud identity programs, you obviously want to have a CIM, or Cloud Infrastructure Entitlement Management Tool, and there's going to be two main areas that this can help you with. The first is in the least permissive. So you want, some, you want a tool that can look at what permissions have actually been utilized and generate policy optimizations that only include those permissions. And that might not be the end, right? You might look at that policy and say, well, we actually do need this one permission in this worst case scenario or for just Black Friday every year or something like that. But it's a starting point. And it's better than having to run to your developers and say, which permissions do you need, right? Because they're just going to say, I want to do it. The second aspect is called identity hygiene. So this is stuff like unrotated access keys, or no MFA, or you have users that are, have been inactive for over this amount of time. Both of those aspects are important, and whatever CIM tool you use should be able to do both effectively. In terms of network segmentation, think about what you can do to make it harder to move laterally and be aware of connections in your cloud environment to your on-premise resources, because this is more common than most people think. And when it comes to cloud detection and response, you want to be able to correlate your threat detection signals from your cloud infrastructure and your identity providers, so your Okta logs and things like that. And remember what I talked about where your threat detection signals should be including things like CloudTrail, the Cloud Control Plane APIs, and runtime behavior of your computes. Um, that's the only way to get a full picture of attacks that move around. Now, in terms of processes, education and training should not be underestimated. Forbes found that when organizations do uh, you know, educational training for victims who fell to social engineering scams, after a year of training, this percentage dropped from 32 to 5%. So education is useful, education is important, and a lot of the phishing attempts and a lot of the things that attackers are doing are really smart and really effective. You know, they copy the exact formatting of, let's say they're trying to impersonate Microsoft. They'll use the same fonts, they'll use everything, so training and education can help there. Where possible, try to shorten your session length for your admin accounts in your big SaaS applications. And where possible, do everything you can to improve MFA and your secrets management. 
So do things like require registration from a trusted location, alerting on devices from unused locations. Uh, I talked a lot about different MFA and secret management things that you can do. Again, I don't think that that's all there is to identity security, but it is a good starting point and it is something that helps when attackers have kind of taken advantage or reached your systems. So if you are confused when it comes to identity security, I want you to know that that is a really reasonable way to feel because identity security is, is difficult, it's complex, but it's necessary. Attackers are investing in identity, so so should all of us. And that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, um, feel free to come up after uh, this talk. And thank you all for coming uh, so late in the day. And hope you have a great rest of your week.